For those of you just joining the meeting, live translation in Spanish is available and members of the public wishing to listen in Spanish can join the Spanish channel by clicking on the interpretation icon in your Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. Once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you only hear the Spanish translation. Charles, can you please restate this in Spanish? Para los recién unidos a la reunión, la interpretación en español está disponible y los miembros del público y personal quienes deseen escuchar en español pueden pasar al canal de español. Para cambiar de canal, haga clic en el icono de interpretación ubicado en la barra de herramientas de Zoom para hacer un globo terráqueo. Ya que se une al canal de español, recomendamos que apaguen el audio principal para poder escuchar la interpretación claramente. Thank you. Chair Cisco, I believe we have a quorum. Okay. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, call to order tonight's meeting of the Charter Review Committee and ask for a roll call, please. Committee Member Weeks? Here. Committee Member Walsh? Here. Committee member Villalobos is going to be absent at this meeting today. Committee member Pitts? Here. Vice Chair Oliveras? Here. Committee member Miner? Here. Committee member Miller? Committee member Mazia? Here. Committee member Martinez. Present. Committee member Ling. Committee member Close. Could, committee member Gudinho. Committee member Diaz. Here. Committee member Cunningham. Committee member Condren. Here. Committee member Byrne. Here. Committee member Bartley. Here. Committee member Badenford. Committee member Barber will be absent at today's meeting. Committee member Arizona. Chair Cisco, I am here. Okay, let me just go circle back. Committee member Miller, have you joined us? Committee member Ling, have you joined us? Committee member Close, have you joined us? Committee member Gudinho, have you joined us? Committee member Cunningham, have you joined us? Committee member Badenford, have you joined us? Committee member Arizon, have you joined us? And I see committee member Miller has joined us. So I'll let the record show that all committee members are here with the exception of committee members Arizon, Barber, Badenford, Cunningham, Gudinho, Close, Ling, and Villalobos. Great. And then Stephanie, do you want to do our housekeeping yes. comments? So committee members, please remember to keep your audio on mute unless you are speaking. As members of the public join the meeting via Zoom, they will be participating as an attendee. Your microphone and camera will be muted. If you're calling in from a telephone and choose to speak during the public comments portion of today's agenda for privacy concerns, the host will be renaming your viewable phone number to resident and the last four digits of your phone number. The city of Santa Rosa is committed to creating a safe and inclusive environment free from disruption. We will not tolerate any hateful speech or actions and are well staffed to monitor that everyone is participating respectfully or they will be removed. If necessary, we will also immediately end the meeting. Public comments will be heard after each agenda item is presented. 
After each agenda item is presented, Chair Cisco will ask for committee member comments and then open it up for public comment. If you are participating from Zoom or by telephone and wish to make a live public comment on a specific item, at the time the public comment is opened by Chair Cisco for that item, please use the raised hand feature. If you are calling in via telephone, you can dial star nine to raise your hand. Throughout today's agenda, when Chair Cisco calls for public comment, an interpreter will be prepared to assist anyone needing translation services. Those using interpreter support will be afforded additional time for your public comment as required by the Brown Act. We ask those listening on the Spanish channel, but wishing to make a public comment, to turn off the interpretation channel entirely at the time you hear your name called so that you can join the main channel to make your public comment heard and translated into English. This icon may now look like a circle with an ES in the middle and the word Spanish underneath. You can then rejoin the Spanish channel at the conclusion of your comment to continue listening to the meeting in Spanish. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, with that, we'll move on to item number two, which is uh, public comments on non-agenda matters. It's a time for any member of the public uh, wishing to address the committee on items that are not listed on our agenda tonight. Um, if you're participating by Zoom, please use the raised hand feature. If you're calling in by phone, dial star nine and you will be recognized by the host and allowed three minutes to speak. And I'll check with our host to see if there is anyone waiting in the queue. I see no hands being raised for non-agenda matters. Okay, great. Thanks. So with that, we'll go ahead and close um, public comments on non-agenda matters uh, and move on uh, to item number three. We have no minutes tonight to approve. Uh, so we'll move on to our scheduled items. Item 4.1 is our equity principles. It's a standing item. Uh, any um, comments from the committee members on that? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, we'll go ahead and ask the public if they would like to make a comment on um, our equity principles. And so same drill. Uh, if you're dialing in by uh, phone, hit star nine. If you're participating by Zoom, use your raised hand feature and you will be recognized by the host and allowed three minutes to speak. All right, Chair Cisco, we do have one hand raised. The first public comment will be from West Below. Okay. Hello, members of the committee. The 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, along with California Constitution Article 1, Section 7, states a person may not be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law or denied equal protection of the, the laws. In the California Constitution specifically, Article 1, Section 31 of the California State Constitution specifies further, the state shall not discriminate against or grant preferential treatment to any individual or group on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in operation of public employment, education, or contracting. It strikes me as odd then that in attachment two, there is a literal map in place that shows which communities are given equity priority over others. It's not enough that your neighborhood is in the top 25% of people, quote, below poverty, unquote, the residents have to be of the co correct race as well in order to get the highest priority. In addition, attachment one states clearly, we will not treat all communities the same. If that is not a more flagrant disregard for the Constitution and the clauses I have specified earlier, I have yet to see it. Our principles in this country have always been to create a more perfect union, establish justice, promote general welfare, provide for the common defense, support the general 
ensure domestic tranquility and secure these blessings of liberty for us and our posterity. Every, anything else serves as a distraction in working to achieve the American ideal. Vote no, please. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Cisco, I don't see any hands being raised for item 4.1 equity principles. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so with that, we'll move on to our agenda item tonight, 4.2 voting rights for non-citizens. Um, Sue, are you gonna begin a presentation and then is Diva going to present or is Diva presenting? All right, yes, um, I'll start with a brief presentation okay. to give some orientation and then uh, we'll hand it over to Diva to talk a little bit more about the logistics and some of the details. And if I may, um, if I may uh, chair, before we go to the PowerPoint, um, if we can just go back to the screen, um, I want to note um, that this evening will be Rob Jackson's uh, last attendance <laughs> at the Charter Review Committee meetings. Um, he will be retiring at the end of this week. Um, so I wanna thank him for all of his work on the issues that we've talked about here. Um, he has uh, been invaluable and is a just a wonderful mem member of our office. So I wish him all the best uh, in a very well-deserved and hopefully joyful retirement. Um, so here's to Rob. Thanks guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wanna chime in on that too. I was gonna yeah. do something at, uh, at the end under reports, but just really, really wanna thank you, Rob, for, you know, we don't see your face that much. We see your name all the time and uh, you are just an amazingly hard worker. It's been such a privilege for me to get to know you and to have the opportunity to work with you. You're truly amazing. So I will definitely miss you. And um, but well deserved retirement and <laughs> and I hope you enjoy it. So yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you. And uh, Jeff has already threatened to nominate me for the next charter <laughs> committee next time around. I stay back. So um, but uh, thank you to everyone on the committee. It's, it's a thankless job you all do, and it's it's uh, reassuring to see so many people who care so much about the city. So thank you all. Yeah, thank and you. Th then thank you. And then to follow up on that, I want to introduce to the group um, Jeff Burke, um, who is uh, joining us uh, tonight. Um, he did listen in last week as well. He's our uh, chief assistant city attorney, and he'll be taking over uh, Rob's position in, in helping uh, both the committee and uh, council in uh, working through the charter uh, charter review. So thank you, Jeff, for taking this on. <laughs> All right, so now we can move to the PowerPoint. And And Chair Cisco, you were probably right. That was probably more appropriate for reports, but I wanted to uh, start that at the meeting. So, no, I'm happy that you did that. I wouldn't want him to get away before we had a chance to thank him. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Signed out real quickly. So, yeah. um, so tonight we're going to uh, start our discussion on uh, voting rights for non citizens uh, as the committee well knows um, this is an idea that came from the committee members. Um, so we will start the discussion. And as I said, I'm gonna give a brief kind of background orientation and then we'll hand it over to Deepa Proto, our registrar of voters. Um, next slide. So the proposal that was made uh, by uh, several committee members um, is to expand uh, voting rights to non-citizens for our city elections. Um, it would enable all those that live in our community to participate in our local elections, um, both ballot measures and uh, council member elections and others. Of course, all the normal uh, requirements uh, would apply age 18 and residency in the city, um, but we would no longer be looking um, to um, 
to evaluate whether someone uh, has their citizenship or not. Um, as I mentioned, the non-citizen voting would be limited to local elections only. Um, we do not, as a city, have the authority to expand voting rights uh, to non-citizens in state or federal elections. Um, and this is an item that would require a charter amendment. It could not be done uh, by ordinance or resolution. Next slide. And then we've, we've uh, just a little bit of back, background. We've talked uh, about this before. Um, Non-citizens non are prohibited from voting in federal and state elections as a matter of federal and state constitutions. California though does not, uh, while it excludes non-citizens from voting in state elections, it does not expressly preclude non-citizen voting in local elections. So it is possible in California. Currently across the nation, there are 15 local jurisdictions that allow for non-citizen voting in, in local elections. And we'll do a quick uh, summary of those ju jurisdictions uh, in, below. Among those 15 jurisdictions, the criteria for eligibility for voting varies. Some require a legal residency, so not undocumented individuals would not be able to vote. Some of the jurisdictions um, simply require uh, age 18 and residency. So. Next slide. Um, again, this we've also talked a little bit about before, but I think it is helpful to look back in history. Um, uh, early in US history, there were 40 states that at various times allowed non-citizens to vote. But since 1926, no state has allowed non-citizens to vote. Um, as of um, this past December, um, there are five states that now expressly prohibit non-citizens from voting also in local elections, so five states. Um, and a couple of those um, have uh, enacted that recently. Um, the literature that we've reviewed also suggests that 14 states have no um, clear currently have no clear uh, impediment to local jurisdictions taking action to grant non-citizens the right to vote in local elections. Um, I think that's um, a lot of that's open to interpretation, but that's kind of the general sense is that there are 14 states. Um, and that list of states was included in some of the materials that were attached. So next slide. Uh, where uh, is it permitted? Where are non-citizens uh, uh, authorized to vote in local elections? Uh, in California, just one city at this point, San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco uh, allows non-citizen parents of school children to vote in school board elections, only school board elections, not other local elections. The rationale is that if you have a child uh, in San Francisco schools, so you should be able to have a say in the school board governance. Uh, and that charter amendment, that is a, was the result of a charter amendment and that was approved um, by the San Francisco voters in 2016. Uh, in Maryland, um, there are 11 cities um, that allow non-citizens to vote in local elections. And some of those have a, had that allowance um, for some time. New York City, as you probably most of you have heard, um, uh, extended the right to vote in local elections uh, in 19, in, I'm sorry, in 2021, just this past year. Um, and it allows for lawful permanent residents and non-citizens that are authorized to work in the US, uh, allows those two groups um, to vote in local elections. Uh, that, um, that law um, has been challenged and is now in court. Um, and then in Vermont, um, there are two cities that allow non-citizens to vote in local elections. And those are both by charter amendments that were enacted in 2021, so very recent. Next slide. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the arguments for and arguments against. Um, the supporters uh, in general argue that um, people who work, live, and pay taxes in the community should be able to have a say in how the community is governed. Granting non-citizens right to vote is simply fair and just. 
Second, allowing non-citizens to vote strengthens the community, promotes engagement, investment, and belonging uh, to all of our residents, um, by all of our residents, I should say. Uh, supporters also um, argue that when a segment of the community is excluded, when non-citizens are excluded from voting, we increase the risk of discriminatory public policies. Uh, in addition, given the high cost and long waiting periods for naturalization, uh, prohibiting non-citizens from voting in that interim time is unjust and unnecessary. And then finally, precluding non-citizens from voting uh, will result in taxation without representation. Folks that um, live and work in our community also pay taxes in our community. Next slide. And on the other side, the opponents argue that uh, people should accept the duties of citizenship before being granted the right to vote. Opponents express concerns that allowing non-citizens to vote could discourage individuals from seeking citizenship and the obligations that attach to citizenship. Um, opp opponents also point out to the significant logistical challenges of establishing a separate voting system for voting for local elections and also point to the associated, the costs are associated with that separate system. We'll talk about that a little bit more and Diva will also talk a little bit about the logistical challenges. Um, there are also possible uh, legal concerns. Uh, as I said, the New York City law is now under legal challenge. Um, some who oppose uh, voting rights for non-citizens um, make constitutional arguments, statutory arguments. Um, so, um, you know, there is that possibility of a legal challenge. There are also some possible risks uh, of immigration enforcement, um, particularly for undocumented individuals. Uh, because we would be creating a voter list that is separate from the state voter list, um, that voter list would identify uh, non-citizens because uh, ICE could simply take a look at the state, the, the county registrar, regist um, voter database and our city database, see who is on our cities and not on the counties and then uh, investigate as to whether those individuals are undocumented. Um, it may also create some level of risk um, for even for legal residents. Um, there is a question apparently on the application for citizenship that asks about whether you've ever voted in a state, federal or local election. And it's, um, uh, we have not yet been able to determine how um, uh, how the immigration uh, system would will deal with um, local, if you voted in a local election in accordance with a local law. Um, in looking at some of the cities that have uh, adopted expended, extended voting rights to non-citizens, um, some um, will provide documentation uh, two individuals that yes, um, this individual was authorized under local law to vote in that local election. Um, also some of the cities um, give notice pretty prominently of the risks to undocumented individuals. Um, those individuals then can make the choice themselves, but the cities do, um, a couple of the cities do uh, highlight um, that there is, uh, there is that risk for undocumented individuals. Next slide. Um, and this is just to talk a little bit about the logistic and cost considerations, but I, I am going to defer to Diva uh, on most of this. Um, the, it will require a separate city database, as I mentioned. It will require a separate city ballot um, because we can't have on the ballot the state and federal elections. Um, and it will require uh, uh, alternative procedures. Um, so I think with that, and the next slide um, is to introduce um, our guest, uh, Diva Proto, who is the County Clerk, Court Assessor and Registrar of Voters um, for Sonoma County. And we are very grateful that she agreed um, to um, participate again tonight. She came and talked to us about ranked choice voting and was so very helpful. 
Um, so we very much appreciate her taking time again this evening to talk to us. Thank you for having me. Um, I don't have a presentation. I just was going to talk a little bit um, about some of the logistics. Um, I talked to San Francisco a little bit to find out how they had set everything up, knowing um, what I know with our system is linked to the state. So we can't add anybody in that isn't a state voter. It doesn't qualify under the state. Um, and San Francisco does uh, maintain a separate database specific for this usage. Um, they have their uh, non-citizens with school aged children who live in the district can apply to vote in school board elections. They have a separate registration form for that and people have to apply for each election. So it does not carry over um, as our data does. Um, those individuals are sent a separate ballot with only that race on it. It is a different color than the official ballots and they are not intermingled in any way. They are tallied separately and uh, kept completely separate. Um, our systems are set up so they can only scan official ballots. So they have to be programmed and such. Sonoma County, uh, while Santa Rosa is a charter city, Sonoma County is a general law county. So we are not able to conduct elections that do not um, comply with state and federal laws. So Santa Rosa would need to do the non-citizen voting on their end. Um, I'm not a lawyer, I can't give any type of legal advice. Mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine that this would, uh, you would have to come up with procedures as to who would be eligible, uh, when you would want them to apply. You'd have to come up with registration forms. Um, I talk about timing, how those ballots are going to get out. The vote centers that we have are going to be linked to the statewide database. So I am not sure how, um, and now under the Voters' Choice Act, voters can go anywhere to vote. I'm not sure if the non-citizen voting would um, be only by mail, how you would verify um, that somebody uh, was a non-citizen living um, in the area, um, but there may be confusion if they're not able to go to um, any of the in-person voting locations. Um, and then we would be able to certify our election results. Santa Rosa would have to do the tallying of the separate ballots um, for the non-citizen voting and then add that to our certified results. Um, so I think that's, um, and then Sue kind of alluded to it, uh, voter registration rules are public. Um, and so there is, you know, something to think about if, if we have lists of people who are um, undocumented or here legally, but where they live and that type of thing. So, and I am happy to answer any questions. I apologize, it was so brief. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for coming again on the heels of a special election. <laughs> so, um, so committee members, uh, this would be a good time uh, to ask questions only to save our discussion points for uh, after I take public comment. But if you have questions now of either Sue or Diva, uh, this would be the time to ask those. So anybody have any questions? Danny. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is more for Sue. Uh, San Jose declared itself as an uh, indivisible city. How would that protect our uh, community, our undocumented uh, community members from ICE if they decided to register to vote? Um, that would not um, provide protection. That precludes us from um, participating actively uh, in reporting to ICE. But um, as Ms. Proto indicated the voter registration rules are public. We would not be able to keep that confidential under other uh, provisions of state law. 
Um, so uh, that is really the avenue that ICE could, um, you know, could come in. They would, you know, they, they can add, do, do a public records request, ask for those registration roles. Um, and then they would be able to get the county registration roles and, and compare the two. Um, now, maybe there would be people who registered only for the local election, but were legal residents, um, but that would give them an avenue into that information. Thank you. Chris. Hi, thanks. Um, I think I have three questions. Uh, number one, is there a clear definition of what a local election is? Are we absolutely clear on what is a local election for these purposes? So obviously, you know, city council might be one thing, but even school board, I don't know if the districts and boundaries are exactly the city boundaries always. So I come to wondering, number one, exactly what elections this might apply to. Secondly, um, <clears throat> I'm intrigued by what you said, uh, Neva, about uh, the county is not authorized to conduct the election. And I know we're just kind of guessing a little bit here, but how would that play out? So, I mean, can the election results be certified? So you come up with the count, the city comes up with the count, who certifies the election? How does that happen? Um, and I, I'm just kind of seeing this dual system in place. I'm wondering how it might play out. And then third, I was wondering, what the different classifications are of non-citizens. You know, there's a reference to permanent residents, authorized to work. I'm wondering if there's other types of documentation for non-citizens, or then do we just go into completely undocumented? So that's that, thanks. Um, I can start and then maybe Sue can jump in. So I, and, Sue so would probably have a better answer on this part, but the districts, um, I believe, would just be the city of Santa Rosa. What the local, I don't believe that the city has any jurisdiction um, over any type of school boards. The districts are not the same and they have their own uh, elected officers. Um, regarding the certification, we would have to keep ballots separate. So we would not be able to certify results that we did not count, um, that were not we have to reconcile our statement of the vote. Um, there is a lot of information uh, that we have to do. So we would certify our results. I believe the city would have to certify their own results, um, probably taking our results and then adding those manually to them, but I'm not quite sure of, of that. And um, I don't have any information about the citizen or the non-citizen type of questions. Sure, and I'll just follow up. Um, I agree um, that in terms of the local elections, what I should be saying is city elections. So we would be governing uh, only um, city elections and extending voting rights only for city elections. So uh, school boards would have to do that their work separately. San Francisco is a little bit different. Um, San Francisco um, is a um, city county, so a little different in terms of um, its structure, and also, as I understand it, their school district is coterminous with um, with the the boundaries. Here, that's not the case. Um, with respect to certification of the elections, um, I also agree um, with um, Ms. Proto that we would be having to a dual system, would be having our results and then the, the county results um, and would have to blend them. And then I also am not familiar and I apologize with all of the different classifications of non-citizens. I've been looking more simply at, are you a legal resident um, of uh, the country or are you undocumented? And that's to me the significant line um, again, I'm not sophisticated in terms of um, all the different classifications of non-citizens. If this moves forward, we may want, may or may not want to make some distinctions. So, and if we, if the committee wants to make some distinctions, I'd certainly look into that further. Uh, Logan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Diva, hello. It's good to see you. Um, thanks for helping us out again. 
Can you remind me, because um, it's been a while since I registered to vote, uh, I'm getting old, and <laughs> what do you do when you register? Do you give any sort of like address verification or are you just saying, I swear I'm this person at this place? How does that work? Um, you are giving us your name, uh, where you live. Um, generally, we are getting um, last four digits of your social or your um, uh, and or your California driver's license number. Um, those numbers are cross-checked against DMV records and against state records. So if somebody registers um, in a different county, it will automatically cancel their registration here. So we are all plugged in in the statewide system um, as is DMV and, and other things. Um, then uh, we're also getting your date of birth. We do have to have a signature, uh, that type of information. So if we um, mail a ballot to you, it's undeliverable. We would mark you as inactive. We would send information requesting you to update. Um, we also get information from DMV, National Change of Address, USPS, that updates us with uh, address information. Okay. But when someone enters their address, you're based and with their signature, that's basically you believing them, I guess. Do you so do you actually verify the address in any way? I'm the, guessing on, the, on that part. Yeah. In terms of are you saying do we send uh we send a voter registration card to them, letting them know if it comes back undeliverable, um, they'll be inactivated. If they don't okay. have a um DMV account uh, and they register via a paper form or if they register online, um, we actually won't be able to, they will be pending in our system until we get a signature. Um, so we send them a letter requesting that. Um, and then we also do need a valid uh, address in the county. So it has to be, we ping against um, USPS and everything like that for addresses to make sure that the addresses themselves are valid. Okay, and just generally, how much work is that for one worker to do or how much time, I guess, would it take to verify one person's address? Um, I mean, I think it depends on volume. We have three full-time people who are doing it daily. So um, I think, you would have a much smaller number with non-citizens. Um, I don't know though what that volume is. Um, and it would depend on what information you're gathering, what the validation process is. Um, now, because we have everything so um, plugged into other systems, we're getting that cross check against DMV records and USPS pretty quickly. Um, but with a manual, like a database, if you're asking for proof of somebody being a non-citizen, what type of proof, how is that going to be validated? I couldn't tell you how long that would take. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sue, some questions for you, uh, in the other jurisdictions that have done this, was there any sort of address verification? So I guess like in San Francisco, there's an application. I thought in New York, maybe there was like a utility bill requirement. Do you remember any of those sort of um, steps that the this different class of voters has to take? Was that in your research? Um, I don't recall offhand. I know the for San Francisco, there is a registration system, but I don't know exactly what they look at. And I'm gonna ask if either uh, Jeff or Rob have more information on that? I, I do not know yeah. the verification system. Okay. Um, like if it's a parent of a school aged child, is that through the school? I was sort of just wondering how do they do yeah, that? Yeah, I do understand that it is um, that, that they're getting, um, they're, they're matching up with the school records. Um, but I, but I don't know beyond that. So. Okay. Thank Sorry. you. That's all my questions. Okay. And again, if, if we want to pursue it, we're happy to, to look at that and also look more closely at the New York law 
as to what requirements um, because they do require that you they do have some so thank you karen uh, thanks patty um i have two questions and i'm not sure if they are for diva or sue so let me just go ahead and um throw them out uh do you have any idea of the amount of money or staff it would take for us to take on this process? I do not. Okay. Nor, nor do I, um, the, but there is a, there's a lot. We would be starting at the city from scratch. We have none of that, none of those procedures are set up. Um, if we needed to have um, a, a ballot counting mechanism, are we gonna hand count them? Are we gonna to try to buy machinery and software to do that? Um, that would, you know, we're gonna to have to, we would have to really research what's gonna be required in order to assure that, um, uh, that those, the integrity of that voting system. So thank you. So it would be an entirely parallel system as to what the county has. And do we have any idea of the numbers of uh, non-citizens there are over 18? I, I know that's probably a, a silly question, but I'd like to kind of figure out what numbers are we talking about? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And I don't, unfortunately, I, unfortunately, I don't have that, th those numbers. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. I was wondering if the census, anywhere in the census, if it provides that um, information, but uh, I should have asked that earlier. Sorry. No, no, we can, we can look for that. Thank you. Danny, you have another question? I do, thank you, Chair. Um, so I was looking uh, back, the DMV issued a driver's license to the, you know, to undocumented uh, community members. And they have, uh, you know, how to verify your uh, your residency. And it's an AB60 driver's license. Wondering if we were to move forward with this, if we can use uh, that model to somewhat verify, because they do ask you for, um, you know, either a, a, a passport from another country, some sort of documentation. They ask you for either a rental agreement where you live, um, a utility bill, things like that that could be used, um, and. Uh, I think that would be something that we could reflect on to create, um, you know, validation that it is somebody that lives in the, in the city of Santa Rosa. Just a thought. That's great. Thank you. Yvette. So I just want to clarify, because um, you said you don't have the cost for the system, but it sounds like if Santa Rosa want to undertake all of that, we will be responsible for everything. And then we would just send you the results and then, but it went, we wouldn't just send the results to you. Um, just to clarify, um, so Santa Rosa always, already pays for their elections. Um, you contract with us to uh, actually conduct your city elections. We would be able to do that and continue doing it with the uh, current registered voters, we just not would not be able to do that with a non-citizen voting. So I think Santa Rosa could choose either to conduct their own elections in whole with getting our voter information data and then adding other non-citizen voters, or you could contract with us, continue to contract with us regarding the election and then do your own for the non-citizen voting. Um, we would okay. not take- That's what I was talking about for the non-citizen voting. That is something that you can now take on, even if we say we want to contract with you. Correct, because we have to operate under state law and okay. this would be separate from state law. Okay, gotcha. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris. Yeah, sorry, round two, a little slow in the uptake. But listening to this, I'm getting the picture that we have two completely separate tracks that have to be followed, that the county can't get involved in printing, distributing, collecting, counting, storing, whatever the ballots. And I'm just kind of wondering, um, 
would that itself create any sort of, I don't know, it could be Voting Rights Act or Equal Protection Act problems or other constitutional or other issues? Because the two systems won't be identical and one might be more burdensome than the other. So I'm just kind of wondering, is that itself gonna create some problems? That's, a, that's an interesting question. I had not, that had not occurred to me. I would think that we would be trying to have our city system equivalent uh, with the county system. I say that understanding fully that we do not have experience in running an election. Um, we don't have the hardware, the software, or the personnel at this point to do that. We would be constructing that system. And uh, I think we would, we would be trying to make it as equivalent as we could to the county system. Um, but, um, you know, is there a possibility that someone challenges us on that? Um, I'm not sure where the challenge would come from, uh, given that there's not, a, we would be creating the right for non-citizens to vote in our elections. I'm not sure uh, if uh, non-citizens or an advocacy group would sue because our system wasn't sophisticated enough maybe someone who opposes the whole idea of non-citizen voting, maybe they challenge it, but I'm not sure they would have what standing they have. It's an interesting question. I really have to kind of think it through. So. Okay, thanks, Jack. So I was also thinking, not just yeah. the logistics, but everything from the registration process is different. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you get yeah. the picture. Thanks. Uh, Scott. Yeah, well, it's uh, most of the questions I have have been asked, but just that uh, Chris just brought one. It's like, so we're developing our own system. And um, Sue, regarding the, the ballot initiative, I would assume we would have to have some description of fiscal impact of this on the ballot. And right. it sounds like there's an awful lot of we don't knows. And how much time do you need to develop that? Um, yeah, would have to really delve into it, and I would be uh, working closely with the city clerk and also um, with uh, Ms. Proto to evaluate what all needs to be done, and then we'd be researching what the costs of each of those elements are going to be. Uh, we would have to get, I, I think uh, you know, Karen raised a very good point of getting a sense of the numbers that we would be dealing with, um, so we would have to have that information um, if, if the committee decides to move forward, I mean, that's all information that we'd need to get and need to be present to the council for the council to be able to make a decision whether to move it forward. Um, if, if tonight's discussion continues uh, to our next meeting, we'll certainly try to get as much of that information as we can. I don't think we'll have any final numbers, but maybe we can get a ballpark um, uh, by that time. But there, there is a lot, there are a lot of pieces that go into that, so. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Sue, I have a question. Um, if this were to go uh, to the ballot and was approved by the voters, what's the promise or time frame for implementation? So, I mean, would it be the next election or you know, just generally, what, what do you think about or what kind of promise would we be making to the public? Uh, I would presume that we would have it be effective for the next um, city election, which would be in 2024, um, but it's not required to be effective. You know, the, the we could cast the ballot measure in such a way that it becomes effective the following election or, or later. But my assumption is that if the decision is that we want to expand in the voting rights that we would want to do that, you know, as quickly as as possible, and that would be trying to have that in line for the 2024 election. Now, maybe if as we delve into what all needs to be done, what all needs to be constructed, maybe we find that it's just not going to be feasible to even have that 
all in place within a year and a half to be able to start that um, that that system. So. Um, okay. Um, any other questions of Sue or Diva before I move on to public comment? Uh, yeah, Yvette. So um, listening to all the commentary about it, it doesn't seem like something that's feasible to get done in the in the year and a half or two years. But if it's if it's something that we want to explore, is that still a possibility to explore the options, look at the cost? Because it sounds to me very pricey. But I think this might be something that we may have to face in the near future, where people are going to start, you know, really pushing for this. So I think it might be a good thing for the city to take a look at it and start looking at the cost and what that would look like. And if not in the next two years, maybe in the next five years or something like that. Okay. Um, any other questions before I go to uh, Adriana? Yes. Hi. Thank you. Yes. Um, sorry, I've been in and out. I apologize. And maybe this was already answered. So I know that this is just a discussion to explore and we might not get to do all the exploration we need to around this topic. Um, my question is even once uh, we explore this uh, area and we decided, okay, this seems feasible or not, the bottom line, this would still be a recommendation to the city council, correct? Yes. I just wanted to know either way is, is we would be putting either the recommendation to explore it more, to to look into this or not to, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. That's all Great. I just want to clarify. Great. And again, any other questions? If I could make a quick comment. Um, okay. I, I was thinking about Chris's question regarding uh, kind of the equality. Um, and I did want to just point out that San Francisco currently has this in place. They have a separate system that is not the same as their election system, um, as their certified statewide election system. Um, I believe they have a database for this. Um, they have different ballots that they print in house that they send um, that are different from the official ballots. They have separate rosters. They have um, they certify their uh, regular results and then they manually add on the non-citizen votes. So that is already occurring with the statewide or with the San Francisco thing simply because you can't really intermingle the the two. So. Okay. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands raised for now. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and open uh, public comment on this item, non-citizen voting. And uh, if you're participating by Zoom, please use the raise hand feature. If you're using a phone, use star nine. You'll be recognized by our host and given three minutes to speak. Thank you, Chair Cisco. It looks like the first public comment will be from Joe. Okay. Joe, go ahead with your public comment. Yes, hello everybody. This is Joe Leadham. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, well, I think this is a very important topic and I think you're right to think about it carefully. I think when you give people the right to vote, you really give them a, a respect that they have a, a say in things. And if it's important to them, all kinds of good things can happen. So my perspective, just hearing this discussion, I think you need to find out among other things is, is it valued? I would talk to the leaders of those communities and say, hey, we're thinking about doing this, but it might cost a lot of money, might be a big hassle, but if it's important to you, if you think this is important to your group, we're maybe willing to look into it at least and maybe even go to bat for you. We've got to get a read from you so you, if you think this is worth it. You know, we talk about inclusiveness, we talk about equity. If it's important to them, this gives them the right to have a say and it gives you respect. And I think it can, can come back to you in a lot of positive ways. So my, I don't know if you can make a decision tonight on this topic. I think you might have to do some homework, talk to some people, evaluate the economics. 
I think the other comment about maybe looking into it is totally valid, but it could be a really good thing if you handle it the right way. So those are my comments. Great, thank you. Chair Cisco, I don't see any additional hands for item 4.2, voting rights for non-citizens. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so with that, I'll go ahead and close the public comment period on this item and bring it back to the committee uh, now for discussion. Um, so let's hear what you think. No one is raising, the, ah, Logan. <laughs> I'll kick it off. Good. So I, yes, um, I am supportive of this idea in theory, but I am not ready to make any sort of concrete motion because I think we still have a lot of unanswered questions. Um, and while I think that the staff could come back next meeting and give us a lot of those answers, I think it would take a lot longer than that, honestly, um, many meetings. And I would suggest that we, forward this to the city council with a recommendation that they uh, maybe incorporate this into charter review or at the very least hold a hearing on it and maybe form a subcommittee. I don't, I don't want to tell them everything what to do. That's up to them. <laughs> but um, I think it's going to take a lot of work. And so I think that that is too much work for this committee and what we have left. Um, and so I'm ready to make a motion, uh, you know, I'll let everyone else discuss or whatever they, they want to do. If, if you don't, if that's out of order, chair. Um, but that would be what I would be supporting is that we really put this into the city council's hands uh, to do all that hard work. Cause I just, I just don't think we have the time or the resources, even though I'm generally supportive of the idea. Um, uh, so I'd love to hear from the other committee members as well, of course. Okay, Logan, let's, um, let's do that and uh, keep in mind that you'll be ready to make a motion at some point. Uh, Chris. Actually, I, I like the idea of folks that are permanent residents or authorized to work, uh, having the franchise in the city elections um, for a number of reasons. Uh, in response to Karen's questions, I took a look in the Pew Research Center. It, estimated there were about 30,000 unauthorized residents as of several years ago in Santa Rosa, which sounds pretty high, but uh, that, was, that was their estimate. Um, so, and with regard to Logan's comment, I don't know the best way to do it, but to send the city council to get the wheels going as firmly as they can, because uh, which comes first? And I think that the city sends the signal to that community that that community is supported uh, and and I, I think that's a good signal to send, so I would support that. Scott. Yeah, I think um, uh, Logan probably has a, a valid idea. I'm looking at it. Um, I don't think there physically is enough time to get it sufficient detail. And I'm honestly very concerned when council looks at it, when you start looking, if you look at the Berkeley um, um, journal that we were given when you look at the numbers discounting san francisco but but the next highest community with um 4200 foreign-born residents 33 of them registered 12 of them voted if you took the cost of this which is going to be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars by the time it's all done and divided by however many votes that's a that's a huge cost out of our general fund I mean, and that's where the money would have to come from. And that would be money that won't be filling potholes, won't be, you know, maintaining parks. You know, that's that's a that's a big hurdle to conquer. So, um, but I think if council wants to discuss it, I think that's fine. Okay. Mark. Yes, yeah, I've been fighting with him today. Um, first, uh, I want to thank Logan for his valor in going first. <laughs> the other thing is, um, I think I'm willing to, to deal with logistical nightmare. I can't speak for the, the city clerk, but um, and thank you, Chris, for speaking to the Pew Research Center data. 
I looked up the statistical tables uh, from the uh, Census Bureau, and it looks like 20.9% of Santa Rosa uh, residents are foreign born. It doesn't say which percentage are uh, naturalized that would have been um, authorized to vote or not. It may be a substantial portion of the population. Um, I'm in favor of the concept, if it, for nothing else, that it signals um, inclusion. As far as how to implement it, um, the 2024 election may be a bit of a logistical nightmare, um, but when you're short on time, maybe compare scope, start with school board. Um, and then if maybe the next meeting we could hear back from council, from uh, the city attorney, I'm sorry, that um, does the school board elections um, that are done in San Francisco, has that um, been legally challenged and withheld that and stood up to that challenge? So if we were to descope it a little bit for now for the first round, uh, could we take on a legal challenge, pick something smaller in scope than what we may want for the long term, and then uh, implement that, and then go back and review the charter in less than 10 years, let's say four years from now, and get that ready for the, the election after that. Um, so I see a lot in some of the districts that have looked at the voter data, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the citizens aren't voting age yet, and that's heavily, um, heavily in the Latino community. So if so those voters age in, I'd like them to have some motivation to vote. Would have liked some of the parents to have a chance to vote. So I, I'm in favor of trying to take some actionable item on this. I'd just like to hear more from the city attorney. If we de-scoped this, would it help survive a legal challenge? And then the city clerk, if we did it for 2024, is that impossible? Or if, if we put it off to say like 2026, like if we picked a school board election. That's my comment. If we can de-scope it to take on the time challenge, the legal challenge, and then implementation costs. Thank you. Yvette. Yes. Um, listening to everything, uh, one of my concerns will be people's safety in regards to ICE. But then knowing some of the people I know, I know they would definitely would like to vote if they could possibly vote. So I think if we dive into this a little bit more, send the recommendation to the, the city council to really start developing that out. I don't foresee it being possible to get it done in 2024, but I think it's something that we really need to consider. And I don't remember who said it, but going back into the community and having that conversation with the community to find out if this is something that they really would like to have and then the city getting behind them and supporting them in that capacity. So many times we do things and put things together and then people don't show up. So I think if we get people invested in the process and ensure that they'll be safe to do it, then they might show up and be a part of that process. But I think we do need to really go back to the community, uh, have those conversations to see if they're willing to step up to, to be a part of this process. So, um, yeah, I would totally be for it. I don't foresee it in 24 year in 2024, but definitely in the near future. Karen. Thanks, Patty. Um, I can't support this without having a lot more information. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the number of folks that we were talking about, um, the actual cost um both in hard and soft costs um and how it could be implemented i think if we send it to the council and say here take a look at this it's gonna um maybe detract from some other work they're doing at the moment so i think until we get a lot more information and whether that be during the next charter review um or at another time um anyway i that's just my thought is I can't support this going any further. Okay, Ernesto. Thank you, Madam Chair. This, I think it's good that this concept and idea has come out, uh, I, but I agree with all of our uh, comments so far. I think the timing is gonna be very tight, but I think it starts the conversation uh, and it needs to be a very big conversation and a long conversation before we get there. Uh, so I, I do see this uh, continuing to, to evolve. Uh, with, with council direction to start that conversation in the community. Uh, again, there's a lot of uh, issues that need to be explored 
um, including that that participation by our, our community members and also ensuring some safeguards for them as well. So it's, it's I think it's a ways out still, but I think that the the idea to be floated out there now is is right, uh, and we will see where it takes us into the future. So those are my comments. Danny. Well, thank you. you know, I want to start by saying that evolution is never easy, and change is uh, is difficult. There's always resistance. But what are we willing to really put? You know our uh, our DEI concept that we keep talking about and really push forward. And this is an opportunity where one, we give those silent voices a voice to talk about what they want in their community. For so many years, there's a lot of people that have gone through the process and just accept what is given to them. And we're, now we have the opportunity to give me, we, we have the opportunity to give them a voice and to vote. And to worry about the cost to give somebody the ability to vote, I think is really, uh, it's, it's hard to swallow that, that, that statement. On the, on the, on the same uh, level, I'm concerned about, our, our, is our community willing to, to participate in the voting, especially knowing that they're gonna be exposed to ICE and the information is gonna be out there. Uh, but I do believe that we need more information. We need to really reach out to our community and, and find out what their thoughts are, what their fears are, to even consider moving this forward. But I'm for it so that we can actually give those people a voice to choose what's happening in their community. Um, I'm gonna jump down to uh, Jasmine because you haven't had an opportunity to speak yet. Hi, thank you, um, Chair Cisco. Um, so I am in agreement with Danny. Um, I think that, um, you know, when we think about diversity and inclusion, this is, this is what the work looks like. Um, Non-citizens contribute in so many ways to our community from, you know, cultural richness to building the most profitable industries in our county and in our city. Um, and when we think about how we include them in, in government um, and how is government accountable to the needs of this um, large and va um, valuable part of our um, community, you know, it starts with voting. And while it is a significant investment and maybe the turnout won't be as large in the beginning, um, this is an investment in the enfranchisement of people that have been underserved, underrepresented, um, disenfranchised, um, forever because I don't think they've been um, allowed to vote in the past um, and yet contribute to our well-being, um, enable the society to function, our city to run um, in, in really meaningful ways. And so I do think that we should forward this onto the council. Um, and I do think that um, this is part of the charter review. So, you know, if they need more information, um, they will, you know, and, and if there's more research to be done, it can be done from now until then. Um, if they choose not to move it forward, then at least it comes as a recommendation um, for, for reviews that um, will come, you know, after that or for consideration, at least that they know that there's a willingness that we, we looked at the issue and, um, you know, that we're supportive, those of us who are. So I would support this. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I think it's significant. And, and, I, and in terms of the risk, um, I don't think it's fair for me to speak on whether um, the risk is um, something that should be taken or not because, because I, I'm a citizen. So how am I gonna gauge, you know, I think that it's up to each and every person to assess whether voting is a risk that they want to take in terms of their data is you know whether they feel empowered whether they already you know anyway there's so many things to consider that i think i think it should be up to the non-citizen to be making that decision themselves um, rather than um whether we should think that that's too much of a risk for, for them or not okay adriana Uh oh, she disappeared. Um, Jen. 
Oh, I'm I'm here. Sorry. Oh, you are. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was I was on mute. I was on mute. I apologize. Okay. okay. I said I, I was saying that yes, I'm 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 also agreeing with some of uh, my colleagues right here, Jasmine, Danny, Yvette, Mark, um, in favor of exploring this. I I yes, I I'm sure this is going to be a huge undertaking, a huge logistical undertaking. Um, but I I also think that it's important. And then that's the reason I asked the initial question. This is a, a group that will make a recommendation to the board to continue to explore this, not to necessarily make the actual recommendation. So I, I am in favor of that until we give a voice to those who don't have a voice, what we're doing with any programs or any supports that we're trying to do or any claims that we are saying that we're doing with DIDV, we're really just doing charity. Um, and we're we're not we're not being respectful. I think also the the concern about the cost. Um, it's also a little bit difficult for me to swallow, just because we are talking about taxpayers here too. And if I'm not mistaken, um, they they are contributing to making sure that they're supporting the potholes and in, in the roads or any of those um, things. So unless the city's not receiving any money from the taxpayers but I don't know. So I, I would be in favor to make a recommendation to, to explore this further. That's it. Okay, Jen. Thanks. Um, I will try to be short. I, 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 this, is a, this is super complicated. It's not easy and in, uh, complicated in many different ways, um, but uh, I, uh, really fall in line with the last few speakers who say that I think it's something that's complicated and um, but worthwhile to take on. Um, and uh, and I do think that when we talk about equity, um, we're just talking about equity unless we're really willing to get our hands dirty and do the hard work. Um, it's uh, So I think there's a way to really walk our talk around equity and around um, valuing all the members of our of our community. So I would recommend uh, or, or suggest that we do, um, instead of talking about how complicated it is, talk about some solutions to that and say, how, how could we, um, what does it look like to, to further explore this? Um, and, and, and secondarily, um, even though it's not really in our purview to make this kind of recommendation for the council, I'd say secondarily to make it a very specific recommendation to the council um, or request of the council, I guess would be more appropriate that they form a subcommittee uh, to try to move this forward with some kind of specific timelines um, associated with that. Um, but if we're really in support of this concept, and it sounds like you know, pr pretty much most people in the group um, are supportive of the concept, um, that at, at minimum that that's something that we should do. But I, I'd hope that we could take this on, even if it meant that we all have to work a little bit more, a little bit harder. I think it's probably you know, one of the most important things we could do. Okay, um, I'm gonna come back to you, Logan, but I just wanna um, get a little clarification here because I'm hearing, well, concerns. Obviously we can't take this up fully and have all of the information at hand to pass on to council. And one of the things that I was wondering about was kind of um, a delivery to council of certain parking lot issues where we're making a strong recommendation that they take them up, not necessarily to be placed on this particular ballot, that these are deeper issues, but like uh, many of you said, to be able to do the community outreach, to be able to do that exploration, but to, to make a, a recommendation that it be, that exploration be begun without the expectation that they could complete that and make a, a decision to put it on the ballot this round. So just kind of want to throw that out there. And then, um, Logan, what do you think? Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of along the lines of what I was thinking, Patty. A motion that we forward it uh, with a recommendation. I mean, other folks can help me with this wording. A recommendation that the council do some sort of study session, maybe, or something like that. That's a deeper dive. I don't I don't know that that's even our our role, though. Sue, maybe you can jump in here and clarify what our recommendation can or can't say? Uh, no, you have um, 
great flexibility uh, in terms of how you put your recommendations together. Um, so you would be free to recommend that the council explore this. Um, you're even free to recommend the methods, whether it's through a study session or a subcommittee. Um, that decision of how they go about it, you know, obviously is up to the council. So. Okay. Um, all right, maybe not ready to make a motion or let's, let's, what do you think, Patty? Should we have some more discussion before I do that? Um, I, well, I've got a couple more hands up. And so um, let, let's keep that going. But um, I, I think the, the two lanes are going to be whether we make an actual recommendation that it be considered for the ballot at this, this go round or that we're making a recommendation that we strongly wanted explored and the method that we'd like council to explore it, not necessarily getting it onto this ballot if, if, if what I'm hearing is what's going on. Would that so be Jen, two separate have... motions or together in one? I don't know, you, you're you my expert. You think about that and I'm gonna ask Jen <laughs> what else okay. you'd like to say, <laughs> okay. Jen. Uh, I actually just forgot to put my hand down but I'm glad that I did and that you called on me, thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, first, I did want to just speak to the school district thing. The school district, we, we don't have any control over what the school district does. Um, first of all, we just don't. But also just the school district boundaries, and I assume we're talking about the Santa Rosa City Schools, are totally different in, in some places outside the, the boundaries of the city of Santa Rosa. So if, if we want to be leaders on this, it's it's we want to be leaders on this within the city. Um, so although it's, I appreciate the thinking of um, starting somewhere. Um, I, Whatever we do, I would hope that that we give this topic the respect it deserves by really talking about a very specific um, recommendation, whether it is putting it on the ballot um, or um, or further exploration for for doing that later, but that has some timelines, that has some specific recommendations that, that, is, that is stronger than just, we would like you to consider this. Um, and, um, and, and I don't, similar to what, how, when, well, I guess I'll just say that for when we talk about council conversation, but, but I don't necessarily think, I think the data thing can be dealt with by people choosing to opt in that seems like a, a relatively simple thing that folks can decide their own uh, risk tolerance around that. Um, but I, 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 I don't feel comfortable with um, putting it on the backs of folks who, who, um, who may or may not feel uh, comfortable within our system because right now they are disenfranchised to come forward and say, yes, we want this. Like the community outreach that says, would you like to be treated um, in the same way as the other residents in this city? I think that in itself is putting the burden in the wrong place. Um, so those are my thoughts. Thanks. Karen. Thanks, Patty. Um, if we do forward this to council, I think we do need to be very um, specific um, and ask them to find certain information um, for staff to provide that certain information on, you know, the cost, I know some people don't like to hear that, but the, the voters vote with their pocketbook in so many ways. And to get this passed, you're gonna have to get the voters to agree to this. So when we look at the cost and also um, the, the numbers of the people that, uh, the folks that we're talking about who could be possible voters, I think those are specific directions that Oh, we can't direct council. Those are specific recommendations to council that um, we should make. And also um, this might be the perfect opportunity for the council to uh, get out of this 10 year uh, charter review cycle and bring this to another charter review committee in a few years um, to talk about some of the other things that we've not been able to talk about because of the time um, constraints. So that's where I am. Okay. Um, anybody else before I go back to Logan? So Logan, what are, what are you thinking in terms of making a motion? Okay, so I think, well, here's my motion. Let's okay. recommend to the city council 
that uh, they examine non-citizen voting and they do that in a study session with the recommendation that they look at cost, uh, I don't know, identity verification or residential verification. Um, I think it'd be helpful for them to see how it's implemented in other cities. So uh, real world examples maybe of like the ballot uh, and I'm hesitant to put a timeline on it personally. Uh, I don't know how to phrase that. So I, I don't know what to do for that part of the motion. So that's my motion is to send it to the city council with a recommendation for various items at a study session. Okay, so that is a motion that's on the table. Uh, do I'll I have a second? Okay. I'll second it. Okay, so Logan has made that uh, motion for recommendation and Danny has seconded it. And so I think with that, uh, we can begin to take our votes. Can, can I um, ask a quick question? Sure, um, Jasmine, sorry. No, no worries. Um, so I have a question um, and sorry, I missed part of the presentation. I had an emergency come up um, and I did look at the slides, but I do have a question. When we talk about non-citizen um, voting, are we inclusive? Are we talking about, you know, undocumented populations as well? Or are we talking about, you know, um, legal residents? It, well, let me, let me amend my motion to say that one recommendation is that the council identify, uh, define the different groups of individuals because yeah, that did come up, Jasmine, in the questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, and also, you know, childhood deferred arrivals, um, or you know, DACA recipients, right? Um, that probably should be a uh, population that's considered as well. Okay, so Logan is uh, adding in uh, to the topics to be looked at under a study session a definition of the groups to be considered non-citizens. Okay. Um, Yvette, did you have a question before we take the vote on that motion? Okay. Well, yeah, uh, and to add on, so this is kind of what I wrote up. Um, the rec recommendation is to be a, put on the ballot at a later time. Council is to explore the best fit process, whether it's study session, subcommittee, or listening session. Look at the data of how many people we have who will be able to vote in the next few years, exploration of other cities, how it was done, cost clarification of non-resident, the meaning of that, and define the groups. Okay, so are you requesting a friendly amendment to add those things in? Yes. Okay. Did you catch all of those, Logan? Uh, I think the only thing that was different was the specific timeline. Okay. Can and you're, that and you're not help me out to... or anyone else? I think well, the, I... the other difference I heard was um, rather than just recommend for them to study it, but um, actually recommend for them to put it on a ballot on the ballot at a future time when these this information has been fleshed out. Okay, I would be comfortable with that. Just not a specific time. I mean, they could put it on the 2024 ballot right now or the 2026 ballot, right, Sue? So they don't have to all go to the, can you correct me on that? Do all these charter review provisions have to go on the 2022 ballot? Uh, they do not have to go. I mean, assuming that we make that change to the charter that allows for, that confirms that charter amendments can come forward at any time. Um, we can go ahead and, you know, the, the council could put it on uh, at any time. Uh, if, if the direction is that they're going to look to putting it on in 2024, you know, I would suggest that we're not trying to do it all then before August uh, 9th of this year that we're trying, that we're giving ourselves additional time. Uh, but certainly you could recommend take that additional time, study this, get all the information, uh, and then it's your recommendation, um, you know, to put it on the 2024 ballot. You would be making that recommendation without. No, no that's not what I was, I just was asking generally, do they have the authority to place it on any future ballot? 
Yeah. Okay. So I think that I'm okay with language that directs them to place a charter amendment for voter approval at a future date. Would that satisfy that amendment? I, I think you have to put their feet their feet to the fire and and put a specific date. Otherwise, you know, I would be I, I'm afraid that it could go to the back burner and just sit back there. And if we're again, if we're really going to put uh, our money, you know, down and and make DI happen, I think we need to have a date. You can't say in a future date with just kind of lingering out there. I think we need to have a specific date and really address it if, if that's what we really want to do. Um, I. How conceivable is it, Sue, to be putting a specific date knowing how city business runs? I mean, I think we're making our recommendation. And again, if we give a specific date, the council doesn't have to take it. But, you know, I want to be realistic here and fair to the council as to what we're recommending. And uh, so what what would you say about that? Uh, yes, I mean, I think you know, it's the, it's up to the committee whether you want to um, state a specific date. Um, and, you know, with the understanding that things happen at the city uh, that we don't expect, um, you know, that can delay a lot of different efforts. Um, so you may want to make it subject, you know, subject to, I, I don't know, I, I don't have a proposed wording right now, but if you say, you know, to try to put a ballot measure uh, on the ballot in 2024, uh, you may want to have some subject to, you know, availability of resources or subject to, um, you know, decisions. It's, it is going to be up to the council. This is the committee's recommendation, uh, but the Council's going to be the one that's now going to be looking at all these detailed information that the committee doesn't yet have in front of it. So, um, you know, whether how about okay? Let me let me make a suggestion for some language that we have them place it on a ballot after the next regularly scheduled election once the study process is complete. What would you call that process, Sue? So the research or legislative research thing maybe the research I, I i yeah i'm not willing to accept an amendment that puts a date on it because i think yeah. that if they want to call a special election they should be able to do that too or if they want to put it on this year's ballot i think that um putting a very specific election actually limits their choices to present it to the voters so that's why i think just saying the next regularly scheduled we could even say presidential election um if if people want to go for that angle more and i think also uh, yeah. we got to remember and i think we also got to remember it's a recommendation of a date it's not we're telling them they've got to get it done by the 20 by the election of 2024 it's a recommendation so they could review it and they could change it and whatnot is that right sue uh yes that that is that is correct it does put a frame framework around it it does put some pressure um, but it is uh, up to council. Um, I think you do want to be realistic in what you're, you know, in any date that you're recommending to council so that you don't put them in the position of uh, recommending something that's not feasible. But beyond that, yes, it's up to them. Uh, Brian, do you want to weigh in? Sure. I just wanted to add that I'm going to be voting no on the motion. Um, and, and I think it's because I don't want to put the council in a position where they can't abide by our complete recommendation. And this is clearly a very complicated uh, process to get the outcome that I think we all want. Um, there's definitely consensus. And um, it, just knowing the process, I'm sure Sue and staff will say there was a strong consensus among our group that this item needs to be investigated in depth uh, quickly, but thoroughly and accurately, regardless of how long it takes. And I'm sure that will report it back to the city council. And I know at least uh, the mayor was on earlier. Um, anyway, so that's, I, I guess that's my point is I'm going to be voting no against the motion, but uh, I'm not completely dismissing that we do have a strong consensus that something needs to be moved forward in a proper manner. 
Okay, so you would be voting no against the motion if we apply a specific date or which we haven't gotten to yet, but that's, is that what you're saying? I'm voting no because I trust- No matter what. Okay. Staff will be reporting appropriately what our discussion and uh, to the council and, and put it in their hands when they feel it's appropriate. Okay, uh, Chris. Yes, um, I'm not comfortable with what appears to be the proposed amendment that we want this put on a ballot, leaving aside the whole issue of a date. I think that, that undermines from and, and distracts from our basic message, which is that I think that there's a lot of support for the notion of some type of non-citizen voting. But as we talked about, there's so many details to work out that I think to send that message with and put it on the ballot, whatever it is, 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 is distracting and would be, I, I'm not a policy, but politically divisive. So uh, I, I would respectfully request that the motion be pretty much as it was originally. Okay. Um, Karen. Thanks, we are going to get to a vote sometime here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Patty. Actually, I um, agree wholeheartedly with Chris. Um, I would like to go back to the original motion without the phrase putting that it will be put on the ballot because we don't know what information is going to be provided. Um, so anyway, I, if as it stands now, I wouldn't be able to support the motion, the original motion I could support. Okay. Um, and an option we have here is to, um, Logan can make his original motion without that, uh, that language. If somebody would like to come in with a secondary motion saying being more specific, um, with Rosenberg's rules, we can have separate motions up to three. We would vote on the last one. So if one of you is very, uh, wants very specific language and you wanna make a motion to that effect, we can take a vote on that motion and then move, if that failed, then we would move up the line to back to Logan's motion. If it succeeded, then Logan's motion becomes um, moot. So if that's an option, if somebody wants to be taking that step. I think we're all headed in the right, in you know, the same direction. Again, there's consensus. It seems to be kind of bogged down about the specifics of putting it on the ballot and when, so. But if no one's gonna, uh, Jen. You're on mute, Jen. <laughs> Can't Thanks. hear you. I, yeah, thank you, sorry. Appreciate all the discussion and sort of as it, as it as unfolds, it sort of has made me sort of more clear in, in my position. And, um, you know, to me, this is the issue of social justice. And, and, and if, I don't know where we would be as a country if we had just made sort of vague statements of support of a certain notion of heading in the direction of social justice. You know, maybe you and I, Patty, wouldn't have the right to vote at, at this point. But so if, if that were the case, and so I, I do think that we should be stronger about it. I also am absolutely opposed to the idea of looking at this as a cost issue unless and until we are going to figure out how to exempt uh, non-citizen residents from paying local taxes, um, then cost, I, I don't think should be a determinative uh, criteria. So I'm gonna make a motion that um, we, uh, th that we are recommending to council um, that they undertake whatever process they deem is necessary to put non-citizen voting on the ballot on or before 2026. And that the I only thing that is that not motion. considered is a, is, a, is a cost consideration. I wanna, I wanna second that motion. Was that you, Jasmine? Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, Jen has made, um, a secondary motion to under just to direct to council that they undertake uh, the process of looking at uh, putting non-citizen voting on the ballot for 2024 uh, and then not looking specifically at the cost issue. And it was seconded by Jasmine. I think she said 2026, was that, is that right? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I had 2024 in my mind, 2026. 
So okay. I, I want to make it clear. So it was a motion to look at putting it on the ballot or to put it on the ballot. I heard undertake process to put it on the ballot. To put it on the ballot. Okay. That's thank what you. I heard. Is that correct, Jen? That is correct. Four years to go through that process. Okay. Um, any other discussion on that, Mark? You want to weigh in on that? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Cisco. Um, I've liked most of the motions so far, and I'm not exactly sure which one we're on, but we can deal with, deal with that later. I wanted to suggest this is the language. So if you know it's a logistical nightmare, it's, it's not likely to happen correctly or without a lot of confusion before we have time to vote on, say, the charter amendments. If we have the council conduct a study on the scope of what the item would be, the timing and the resource requirements, and complete that scope of work by, let's say, said some time certain, and then have, have the non-citizen voting item then placed on the ballot. Jen's idea, I think, gave enough breathing room to make it realistic. So I appreciate the idea, even if you know maybe people would have preferred 2024. I think that makes it more realistic. Um, but but just some of the language, I think if, if there's a if the council conduct a study to prepare for non-citizen voting, and that study would show us the scope of what it would be the timing of when it would happen and the resources that are that need to be in place to make it happen correct. And then they could consider anything, but that's just the language I would use. So it's like project scope and plan and how to get it done. So they would prepare a, a plan with um, the scope of work, the um, scope of the voting, and then the timing when it would happen and the resources. Because they can't just throw this out there. They won't have enough information. Anyway, that's my thought. So, Jen, it sounds like Mark is throwing out a potential friendly amendment of language to your motion. Are you willing to accept that language? I'm not totally clear on can, exactly what the... the I, I'm asking if, if it would be helpful to say that, so you're asking council to, to get the item on the ballot by a said date. Um, that's fine. I mean, I would, I would go ahead with that item but they're gonna to need to do a project that says, here's the scope of what we're gonna put on that ballot and have communications with the citizens, right? It's gonna be just school board elections, just city elections, are there any qualifiers, right? Who can and can't vote under what circumstances? So, so I, I think, Mark, can I, can I just address that? Is, that? is that in my motion and language was to undertake whatever, whatever process it is they deem necessary because I think either we could have many, many, many meetings to decide exactly what process they should undertake Absolutely. and that would be complicated or we could just say, let's leave it to council and figure out what they need to do. So I don't think it needs to be an amendment to your item and that wasn't necessarily my suggestion, but at a minimum, let's say, let's say if people have problems supporting this overall, we need to figure out what the scope is, right? Who can vote under what circumstances on which elections? And then what the timing, right? And so if the scope is huge, the timing is gonna take more time and more resources. So just have the council and the city give some indication, study what they can do. That can be a whole separate item. If the voting issue is not gonna hit the ballot till 2026, I think there isn't, probably would be enough um, resource to get it done. So it doesn't require an amendment. It's just a suggestion that no matter what, you know, they're gonna to have to conduct a study on scope, time, and money. And that's the comment. So I'm not proposing so, it, but I'm not proposing an amendment to her motion. Oh, okay. So you're just clarifying what you understand her process, undertaking a process to mean. Yes, to get anything okay. done. There's okay. No, Got it. No bad. Okay. Got to get to the citizens and say, what's the scope, time, and money look like to get this done? Because all the concerns I've heard so far is we don't know what it looks like. We don't know when it can happen by, and we don't know what it's going to cost, right? So they're going to have to figure that out um, regardless. Right. Yeah. Okay, so um, secondary to uh, Logan's original motion, we would vote on this second motion first. It's a motion uh, that uh, Jen has made to undertake a process to put non-citizen voting on the, the ballot for 2026 was seconded by Jasmine. 
we'll all have the opportunity to vote on this. If this motion passes, then we don't uh, go back to uh, Logan's motion. If this motion fails, then we go back to Logan's motion and vote on that. So is everybody clear on that? <laughs> okay, I think we're ready to vote, Stephanie, on Madam this second Chair, motion. Madam Chair, this is uh, uh, Ernesto here. I think uh, one of our member, Lisa Badenford, is in uh, as a guest. I'm sorry, uh, what? Lisa we've, Bettenport. I think is oh, is she on? Is she well, been we've been in? trying to promote her to panelists, but for some reason, um, she's not promoting. I don't know. Oh, okay. She can't do it by because of the device. But both Dean and I have been trying to promote her. We it just, like did, we not, just but, yeah, we just enabled her audio so she can vote. Oh, okay. I'm here. Uh, okay, thank good. you. Yes, thank you. I'm uh, sorry. I was just sitting here quietly. Um, here we go. Join us. There we go. Okay. Are we ready? Are we ready? All right. Committee member Weeks? No. Committee member Walsh? Yes. Committee member Pitts? No. Co-chair Oliveras? No. Committee member Minor? Yes. Committee member Miller? Yes. Committee member Mazia? No. Committee member Martinez? Yes. Committee member Ling? No. Committee member Close? Yes. Committee member Gudino? Yes. Committee member Diaz? Yes. Committee member Condren? No. Committee member Byrne? Yes. Committee member Bartley? No. Committee member Badenford? No. Committee member Adazong? Yes. Well, and Chair that. Cisco. Uh, no. Okay, let me see. Count this up here. Three, four, five. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I think that's tied. Is that not? Yes. Yes. The vote is a tie vote and so the motion fails on a tie vote okay so um with that we go ahead and move up to uh logan's uh motion which was to recommend that the city council take up and examine non-citizen uh voting by study session that as part of that study session they define the groups look at cost um figure out how identification will be verified, how it's implemented in other cities, um, et cetera. And so that motion uh, was made by Logan and seconded by Danny. Any, anything I missed there, Logan, before we take the vote on that? I took off to place the ballot on at a different time because you weren't willing to take that amendment. Is that correct? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd also add any other information that they deem necessary for the process. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and vote on that. Can you, can you just repeat the, what we're voting on again? Yeah, we're voting on Logan's uh, motion that we recommend to council that they examine uh, non-citizen voting by study session. As part of that study session, they would be looking at defining the groups, uh, the cost, um, how identifications would be verified, how it's implemented in other cities, and um, anything, any other information that they deem of import to this. So, well, let me just be, I'm saying that I want this into the charter review process, but with a recommendation 
that they conduct a study session to examine all those issues. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're thinking they can com they would complete this study session prior to their decision as to what goes on the ballot or not? Well, like I asked, that's up to them when it goes on the ballot. So the okay. Carter review process can extend right. beyond the other items. Yes. So yes. we're still putting it into that process. Yes. And yeah, okay. Oh, okay. I think we, we've got it. And our votes on this. Committee member Weeks? Yes. Committee, me committee member Walsh? Yes. Committee member Pitts? Yes. Co-chair Olivares? Yes. Committee member Minor? Yes. Committee member Miller? Yes. Committee member Mazia? Yes. Committee member Martinez? Yes. Committee member Ling? Yes. Committee member Close? Yes. Committee member Gudino? Yes. Committee member Diaz? Yes. Committee member Condren? Yes. Committee member Byrne? Yes. Committee member Bartley? Yes. Committee member Badenfor? Yes. Committee member Arizona? Yes. Committee Chair Cisco? Uh, yes. Okay, that motion passes by majority vote. Okay, and then I just want to remind the, the committee members that um, when we we give our final report to city council, it will include the information about the feelings about make, you know putting it to a date certain and all of that. What we'll, we'll cover what was said here, so that won't can get I lost. Ask a, sure. Can I ask a question, Chair. Uh, will it note that that was a unanimous vote of support? Yes. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think we have completed that. I don't think we have time tonight to begin 4.3 council compensation, um, but we'll, we'll be taking that up next time. And so make sure you do the reading of what's available there and start to think about how you wanna um, uh, craft that. And again, I wanna really thank uh, Diva Proto for coming. I think she maybe has left, but uh, to thank her for her, her work here tonight. So with that, uh, let's go on to, oh yeah, let's go on to committee chair, city attorney's reports, anything from the city attorney? No, nothing to report. Okay. And I don't have anything to report other, other than a, another goodbye to Rob Jackson and thank you so much. <laughs> so um, we don't have any subcommittee written or electronic communications. Uh, our future agenda item is set. And so with that, wow, we're gonna be 10 minutes early. <laughs> okay. <laughs> with that, I'll adjourn our uh, meeting and uh, we'll meet again uh, at our next regularly scheduled meeting in April. And again, thanks for all your hard work and all of your opinions and delving into this. This was, this was very great. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Thanks, Chair. everyone. Thank you, Chair Cisco, and thank you, uh, City Attorney Kelly. <laughs>